Okay, but anyway, we're going to be in uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Um, the question and answer, the shorts with Scott will not be tomorrow because I'm going to a Christmas party tomorrow, but I will have them on Friday sometime. Um, not, not sure exactly on the time, but I'll send out probably a 30 minute head start in case you want to see it live. If not, then you can see what, what most people do is they'll uh, watch it uh, post recording. But anyway, let's go ahead and pray in so we can get into this into this service. And there's some other things I want to talk about as well. Also, Father, thank you for this day, your blessings, your mercy and your grace. We ask for your Holy Spirit to give us the words to say and the words to hear. And guide us and use us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, again, like I've been talking about on everything we're seeing going on, uh, there's a reason for it. It's called birth pains. Um, is what's going on. They're going to get closer together and, and, and stronger and, and closer together before the rapture happens. Um, don't let the news shake you. Uh, like we hear in... Uh, Israel, where three of the rabbis are supposedly talking to the, the Messiah. That's, if that person's known, then it can't be the Antichrist because these, uh, it's very clear in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, that no one will know who he is until after the rapture, until after the Holy Spirit's been removed. Uh, so don't get, I mean, it could, do we know if it could be the the false prophet, we just don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us that on who they are. And it's going to be a physical man as the Antichrist. Now, there is a spirit of Antichrist that's been around since day one, but an actual physical manifestation of an individual, a male, not, not a female, but a man. Uh, he's going, it talks about how he's not going to be interested in uh, relations with, with a woman. We don't know if it, what means anything else as far as his identity. But we just know that he is going to be male, and the false prophet is going to be male. But we, the Antichrist will not be revealed until the until after the rapture. Okay. Also, all the stuff that's going on um, with uh, we're seeing stuff coming out of Washington where they're they've you know said, oh, now we got fairness in marriage. Okay, that's not marriage. Okay, I'm sorry. According to God's standards, and people say, well, that's bigotry or that's whatever you want to call it. We're going according to God's standard. God's standard says one male, one female, one man, one woman for life to be married. Okay. And that's his standard. And no one has, no one can re, uh, redo what God says is marriage. God's not going to say, okay, uh, whatever you say. No, he's not. <laughs> uh, so therefore, God's idea of what marriage is, God's idea of what righteousness is, God, God's idea of what sin is, has never changed from day one. And it won't, according to what he says. So, just be aware, the reason all this is happening, all the insanity, like what um, Romans chapter 1 said, said that one of the, the last phases that we're going through is a time of insanity or a, a debased mind. And we have that's what we've got. I mean, just look at the news. I mean, We've got people in government that don't know what they are, um, little physically. And then when I was looking at an article today uh, about some of our military leaders that are thinking they're animals. I mean, it's like you can't make this up. And then on top of that, anybody who wants to be um, to to stand and say, "Listen, I, I don't want to. I'm not going to discriminate against you, but I believe in my Christian faith." and I love you, but I don't. I don't have to agree with you. Just like you don't have to agree with me. Okay, that's what people do. Uh, we can still we can still be friends, even if we disagree. Okay, but what's happening is like the baker, uh, the woman, the guy, the bakery shop has been sued so many times. The Supreme Court stepped in. The wedding planner. And what's happening is these two people, these two businesses are saying, listen, there's hundreds of other businesses that would be more than happy to do your wedding or whatever. It's against our religious belief. And they get attacked because they seek them out to try to destroy their, their business. Okay. The, the thing is, remember who is giving instructions on each side. You're either with God or you're not. It's good versus evil. 
the people are being used as a tool for one or the other. What I mean by that is God says he actually uses both believers and unbelievers to get his, his plan. Like, for instance, he used Pharaoh, a pagan, to get uh, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, out of Egypt. He hardened his heart. He's used, many times if you, has used evil kings like in Babylon, in, in Syria, in Nineveh, and all the different places to get his, 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 uh, what he wants done completed. Okay. Then he goes in and he also, obviously, more than not, uses the people who are obedient to him, obedient to, to serve and to be a tool in, their, in his hand. In other words, knowing that we don't have the power in ourselves. We have zero power in ourselves, no uh, power of prophecy or, or of, of anything without the Holy Spirit giving it to us. Okay, And if we're obedient and we're willing to be used, then God does that. Okay. So what's happening is we're moving closer and closer and closer to the before our Lord comes and gets us. It could be days, could be months, could be years. We don't know, but we do know the season, and we're in it. We don't know how long that season lasts. The one of the commentators y'all might have seen this on uh, Tom Hughes. Uh, he's had a, an article out here in the last few days. Uh, he was they were he was having a commentary. Uh, and they were talking about how that we, when you see a, a, a foundation being put on the ground, you know there's a building getting ready to go up, or you see the rafters, you see it's almost completed. You know, it's just common sense. When we see the things being put in place, like the one world government, which is already, they're pushing right now, the, the United Nothing, and the uh, they're putting in for a one world currency, and they're putting in for a one world government, one world religion, and they're pushing for this. When we have uh, the universalist, even the Catholic Church is trying to, is, is getting involved in this with 1.2 billion people. Uh, and you've got the other religions are gonna fall right in place and they already have. Uh, you can see the framework of the tribulation, what's gonna happen during the tribulation, it will come and it'll finish. How long will it take? Don't know. Should we be concerned? We should be looking up when we, Christ says, when you see these things happening worldwide, not just like what we're seeing now, we're seeing everything happening worldwide. We are to get excited. We are to know that our our time is short. So it is to go out and, and, and be bold and to preach the gospel. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're a burger flipper at McDonald's or whether you run a company, it doesn't matter, male, female, black, white, rich, poor, doesn't matter. Ask God to put somebody in your life to be able to spread the gospel to because what's going to happen if you if you are used and somebody comes to a saving knowledge of Christ because you were used as a tool in the hand of God, you'll be blessed because of that eternally. If you ignore it, he'll bring somebody else in your place and you'll miss that and you'll be disobedient to what he tells us to do because in Matthew 28, 19, he says, go and make disciples, followers of Christ, and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, you may not personally baptize them, but you may get them into a church where they will. Um, but the, what we're seeing here is nothing new. Okay, so I wanna go ahead and move on. I just wanted to, to address that because people are getting uh, nervous, I guess you'd say, Christians. If you are a, you, you, you're claiming Christianity and you're in, in one of these churches, these uh, Word of Faith movement, uh, the name it, claim it churches and everything, uh, where they pull just a, a phrase out of the Bible and they make a whole sermon uh, on, on just a, on a, out of context and make it a, a good warm speech, uh, a, a motivational speech. If they're doing that with the scripture, they're doing that also with the gospel and with the salvation message. And if they say, well, God's okay, we don't want to judge, you know, people in our church, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to tell them what sin is. And the, if that pastor or that church is not doing that, then they're, they're they don't love you. Because if you had a, a, a sore or an injury uh, that was in, getting infected, and I didn't want anybody to do anything about it, as a friend, one of my, a friend of mine who loves me would say, listen, 
that injury is going to get worse until it eventually kills you. You'll get gangrene or whatever. It'll poison you. But if you go, get, go to the doctor and get some help, they can, it can start healing. Well, the thing is, the churches are supposed to be telling people, not give them a big concert and say, okay, thank you, and pat you on the back and make you feel warm and fuzzy. What they are to do is to tell you the truth in love, not to beat you over the head with the Bible, not to say, you know, turn or burn or whatever you want, the phrase you want to use. Their job, and we as Christians in those churches, job is to point people to Christ, to forgiveness. And people say, well, I, I, I want Christ, but I want to be able to keep whatever sin I have. And God says, no, it's, it's, it's all or nothing. Because if you don't admit that whatever, you, whatever you're doing is sin, whether it be lying, sexual perversion, uh, stealing, adultery, idolatry, whatever. He says, you're, you're holding on to one of them. That means you don't recognize that as sin. So how can you confess something to me that you don't even see as sin? See the, see the point here? You're asking for God to forgive you of your sins except for that one because you don't see it as a sin. Or you confess a sin with the full intention of not turning from it but to dive right back into it. Not struggle with, because we all struggle with our sin, but to dive off into it and just say, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and go on into it because I'm just going to do it. Okay, God says you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, read it for yourself, okay? The reason I got off into that is because I'm hearing so much. It's just, it's like trying to drink out of a fire hose. Um, and some of you are shaking your head going, yeah, we know what you're talking about. I do not suggest that most of you try to ingest as much uh, of the news and the and what's going on every, around the world so much because it's just a 24-hour supply and most of it's false. Um, you have to be discerning. I only listen to, uh, I like to listen to Amir Shafati, which is uh, Hope for Our Times, or no, excuse me, uh, Israel Now. Uh, the Next one is Tom Hughes. And you can go to the pray5.org website and click on resources and it'll show you pastors that I listen to. And, and when I, I've actually had to remove some of them because they've changed. Um, like the one who wrote The Purpose Driven Life, I had to take him off. Rick Warren, I had to take him off because he went to he went south. Uh, and uh, several others have, have done that and they've, they've bought into the world. So be careful. Okay, and I, the reason I said all this is because it says in the end times there will be many who will deceive. It said they will have a form of godliness, but the truth is not in them. Run from them, turn away from them, get away from them. And that's in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Those ones we're seeing on TV right now. It says they call them the false prophets or the false teachers. That's the Joe Alstein's, Kenneth Copeland's that we're seeing on, on right now that are, that are on there, okay? Okay, let's go ahead and go into chapter 3, verse 1 in Ephesians, okay? Uh, this one, last week was uh, Christ is our cornerstone. We, we learned, he gave us the first two chapters was leading up to what's coming up in 5 and 6. And 3, obviously, is going to be, 3 and 4 is going to be putting it together like the the uh, segue. So let's go ahead and di dive off into this if we can, please. Just to give a little a little bit of history or a little bit of understanding on what's going on here, Paul, uh, when he was when he was uh, he went in and got arrested. Okay, and he was in he was in uh, jail for uh, two two or three years. I can't believe I just went blank. Well, anyway, he was chained to Roman guards two years two years. And he wasn't getting anything done. He was trying to get the word into Rome and trying to get to try to help him to build to spread the gospel to the higher ups to build to get in the government so therefore it would spread out throughout the land. Well, when it wasn't happening like he was wanting to, he uh, he, he claimed his Roman citizenship, which he was. He was fully he was a Pharisee, but his dad also paid for his Roman his Roman citizenship. Uh, and that meant something back then. The he said, "I want to take my case to Caesar." And I said, "Okay." He said, "It's going to cost you, but yeah, well, it'll be fine." So he goes off to Rome, and he has to wait for a long time. 
And during that time, he writes uh, uh, Ephesians. This is the prison epistles. There's three of them. The prison epistles. It's uh, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians. And that's what he wrote in, in, the, in the prison before, before they killed him. So, while he was, so when you're reading this, understand that these three are while he's incarcerated. Okay? Um, oh, let's go ahead and go into it. Verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Because remember, Paul went to the Gentiles. Peter, or excuse me, Philip went to the Jews. So God sent a Gentile to the Jews and a Jew to the Gentiles. <laughs> so anyway, it says, if, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that you may, may, that you may by revelation, he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay, we keep coming across this term mystery. It's uh, it's mentioned three other times in Rome or in Ephesians. Okay, and it's not just Ephesians. There's uh, Thessalonians, and there's uh, let me see three other three other books it's written in. The mystery of this, the mystery of that. And you can Google it. And it'll show you, or go to the concordance and type in mystery, New Testament, and it'll show you all the ones it's talking about. The mystery is saying he's Christ, the Holy Spirit is revealing through Paul what the mystery of, the, of, of Christianity is, what the mystery of the forgiveness, what the mystery of that was of how you can have two a Gentile and a Jew who are now, if they if they're if they're saved, they're now considered brothers or sisters, or sister and brother in Christ. They're now of the same vine. They're of the same tree. The, the olive tree is, is what he's using. And he's going to get into that here pretty quick, and I'm going to go through an analogy on that. It's kind of cool. Okay. It says, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. In other words, this hadn't happened until recently because Christ is the one who, who completed it and completed, completed the covenant between God and man for both Gentile and Jew and Gentile. Jew first, then Gentile. Okay? And the sons of, of men, as it has now been revealed by the Holy by the Spirit of God to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should should be fellow heirs. Okay, fellow heirs? Think about it. Before Christ, only the only ones saved were someone who was in the Jewish faith. Kind of like today, the only ones who are born again are Christians. Now, if you're a Jewish believer, you're what's called a Messianic believer, then that is uh, you're born again. Okay, you can you can put a, a label on it whether you say Christian or completed believer or Messianic believer. It's the same thing. It's just another name for the same the same uh, uh, belief. And we believe in the Messiah who came and died for our sins, whose name was Yeshua. Heirs means we're co-heirs with Christ. We're not gods. We're not going to be gods. I don't care what the Mormon religion says. You're never going to be a god. But he, he will be co-heirs to rule and reign with Christ. Okay, we'll, he'll, he'll appoint us to do whatever it is we're supposed to do. Okay, but we'll be co-heirs with Christ. Okay, both Jew and Gentile who accept. It says co fellow heirs of the same body. That's the same body of Christ. And partakers in his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace to the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his of God's power in other words he's saying very clearly he's like okay I was brought in even though I was a Jew I was brought in forgiven the mystery of okay Jew and Gentile can be saved I'm God sent me to the Gentiles to preach the gospel which that's not what he was thinking it was going to happen. And he said, he gave me the understanding of the word. Realize, Paul didn't just, on the road to Damascus, after he got the scales fell off, he just hopped up and started going to do it, and started his ministry, and everybody's just saying, oh, hey, wait, there you go. He found about 14 years, three years at one place. Then he'd say he spent so many weeks here, so many months there, and up to 14 years. 
This man was, was being trained on how to teach the gospel effectively. And he was going around, the, he, he was, his trek around the Mediterranean is, is very extensive. So anyway, that's another study. But what is he referring to when he says that we're becoming two as one? Remember how last week God was saying, you know, the Gentile and the Jew were coming together? And you're thinking, okay, what? How, how does this work? Okay. The Jew and the Gentile were polar opposites. The Gentile would worship a pagan gods. The Jews would worship the one true God. Okay. Well, now that Christ completed the covenant, Christ, who is God, said now anybody, whether you be Jew or Gentile, can accept this, you're a new man. Or new, when he says new man, he's referring to your soul. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says you are a new creation. Okay. What he's referring to here, when, he, when he's talking about it, he said, the Jew and the Gentile are coming together. Um, How does that work? Glad you asked. Uh, let's go ahead and go over to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And we're going to start off in verse 17. Verse 17, 11, 17. And now this is, keep this in mind. Well, I'll, let me read this and I'll explain, the, I'll explain the, what, he, how he, what he's looking at to make it a, a better picture. Verse 17, and I'll start off in verse 14 for context. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I do will do, what he's explaining is, I do everything I'm not supposed to. And what I want to do, I don't do. And what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot of uh, do's there. He's struggling with his sin. And I, I need for you to understand this because when we go into the Gentiles are going to be are going to be grafted into the same branch that he is. Okay? And he's explaining that. He says, I do not understand for what I will to do, that I do not do, I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I what I will not, this takes concentration on this. If then I do what I will not do, want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that in me, that is in the flesh, nothing good dwells for to, for to will is the present is present in me, but how to perform what is good, I, I, I don't find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Verse 20, now if I, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I, who do it, but it's the sin that dwells within me. Okay? So therefore, he's saying, I, I'm struggling here. Okay? I wasn't planning on going that far on that one, but it's there. Hang on just a second. Um, okay, the... Okay, I hate when I lose my place. Don't you hate that? Okay, what it is, he, he goes in into um, sorry I was in chapter 8 that would it would help if I learned how to read numbers okay but I'm, I'm still was going to use that one I was going to put it on a different spot on, on my lesson tonight so when I, I'll refer back to it let's go to Romans chapter 11 verse six, seven, uh, 16 and 17. Now this is talking about how the Gentile, who's also struggling with the same thing as Paul, only the Gentile would, would normally they would they were known for giving in to their to their lust and giving in to their sin, but now they have a way of forgiveness. Okay, and Paul was struggling. Think about this. Paul was uh, was the greatest believer of the New Testament. Just about uh, Christ said that John the Baptist, his cousin, his first cousin. Um, Actually, that'd be his second cousin. The said that this is the greatest believer 
the, of, the, of this time. Paul, the apostle, wrote 13 books of the New Testament. And I think he wrote Hebrews, but I can't prove it. But anyway, we know for a fact he wrote 13 books of the, of the, of the New Testament. And he says he struggled with sin. To say that we just give in to it, say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Even Paul said, no, it's not. He said, I struggle with it. It's something I struggle with. I, I don't give in to it. He said, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to sin. But I still do it. I still fall off into temptations. I still fall off into the desire to sin. He said, I hate it. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, the Gentile, like, let me get back to what I was saying. I'm sorry for chasing that rabbit. Is the Gentile says, how does the Gentile, the Jew and the Gentile get become co-heirs? How do the Jew and the Gentile become one? Will the two become one in, in belief? One in is co-heirs underneath in, in the faith of Christ, of God. Here we go. Verse 16. This is a, a Romans 11, verse 16, starting off. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a valid, uh, a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them become a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Verse 19, you will say then, branches, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in, Okay, what's he referring to? The Gentile. The branches, okay, remember, when he's referring to an olive tree, he's referring to the Jewish people of, of Israel. Some of the branches are broken off. He's talking about families that were had separated, that were, that were no longer uh, active, uh, or the, the uh, tribes that may have been separated but brought back together. We know in this time what we have now. But the Gentile was grafted in to that olive tree. Now, the way it was explained to me by someone who knows olives, um, olive trees, and they lived in Israel, and they told me more than I, was, than I really cared to find out was an olive tree, a native olive tree, which you have, you know, different kinds of olive trees, olive trees for cooking, olive trees for this, olive trees for that. I didn't realize there were so many. Um, just like grapes, there's so many different kinds. If you have a regular olive tree, the uh, if you cut a, a slice in it, like people who know how to do all this and put trees together and make different things, that's great. What they do is they take a, a wild olive branch from a wild olive tree, make the slot, graft it into the tree of the of the, the regular olive tree, and then they would wouldn't eat the fruit for three years. Well, something happened for those three years. Because they said that the fruit would get bad before it got good. But after three years, after three seasons, then, they're, then it's like really good. And if you were to pull that all, if you were to pull that branch out of that tree, then it would revert back. It wouldn't, it would, it would revert back to the way it was. Okay. The thing is, when, you, when that branch becomes part of the tree, the wild strength of that of the wild olive tree which didn't have good olives it wasn't something you would go and serve to your friends which strengthened the the native tree the native tree in 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 kind would give fruit to that branch that was that was good they worked together as one two separate things same tree worked off and fed off the same roots so before somebody can say oh look at us you know we're, you know, we're grafted in, so therefore we're better than the Jewish people. We're, you know, now God's separated from the Jewish people. That's a lie. Because the Christians haven't replaced the Jewish people as God's chosen people. We're in the church age and we're the bride of Christ, yes. But as soon as we leave, then God turns his attention back to Israel. Okay? So, this is referring to the, the two together feeding off the same root, which would be the root of Christ, of, the, of Christianity, of being born again. Because God says, I am no respecter of persons. I don't care if you're born the best Jew or the best whatever. He said, you feed off the same, you feed off the same root. 
Makes sense. Okay, so therefore, before somebody goes around and says, oh, you got to listen to us, read the Bible, okay? Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to verse 8. It says, to me, who, who am less than the least of all the saints, the saints are born again believers, remember, when it says saint, it's not when somebody, you know, one of the 440 some odd people that a church uh, anointed is, oh, that's a saint, no. A saint is a believer or a born again believer. A Christian, okay? He said, I'm least than all of the saints. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's saying, I'm not even worth, look at all the stuff I've done, and God's forgiven me, and I'm the, I'm, I'm worse than the worst Christian there is. I'm the least, I'm not even as worthy as the worst one. That's humility. Verse 9, he said, and to make all see what is what is the fellowship of the mystery, there we go again, how those two can come together, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It says, all things were created by Christ. John chapter 1 verse uh Chapter 1, verse 3, it says all things were created and there wasn't anything created that wasn't created by Christ. He had the authority. God the Father said, make it. And through his own strength, through his own authority, Christ's own authority, he created everything. Okay, even, even in, we're listening to not only the, the Apostle John, but the Apostle Paul saying the same thing. All things were created by Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the by the church to the uh, principalities and the powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, when it's referring to, it says the manifold wisdom, it says we're being watched, okay? We're, we're being watched as a people, as Christians, as a church. When you say the church, he's not referring to a building, obviously referring to the people, the the coming together, not the fake church, which we're going to see a separation here, or we're already seeing it. The true church, those are the ones that refuse to back down, refuse to to uh, worship, bow and worship the image, which is happening, I mean, not literally the image, but are giving in to being woke, are falling into the trap in the world system. So therefore, they're going away from God and going towards the world system, said, oh, we'll, we'll compromise. The true church is gonna say, we're not gonna compromise no matter what you do to us. And as the pressure increases, the true church will come to the surface, okay? And that's what we're looking for, okay? And we're being watched by the angelic beings that are watching, and they're watching the principalities and the powers that are watching us, also are seeing what the church is going to do, the true church, okay? 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. We have access to him. Who, who is he referring to? A access. Remember when Christ died on the cross, he completed the covenant and said that the veil of the temple on the Holy of Holies was ripped from the top to the bottom. That's God coming down to man, not man going up to God. He said, now you can pray directly to the Father. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor to pray for you. I mean, yeah, you want people to pray for you. Don't, don't get me wrong. But you can talk to God personally. When he, when you talk, he's listening. Okay? Now, whether you have something worth saying or not, that's up between you and him. Verse 13. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees, plural, on both knees. He's in subjection in obedience to God, obeisance. I bow my knees to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that he, God, would grant you, according to his riches and his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit, his Holy Spirit, in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart or in your soul through faith. Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 10 tells us that God indwells our soul. God the Holy Spirit indwells our soul and God the Son indwells our soul. 
So, and that's what he's saying. And while he's in prison, he's asking God to bless and to strengthen the people on the outside who are free while he sits his honey in prison. <laughs> that's dedication. He said, in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints, all the other believers, what is the width, the length, and the depth, and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. He's asking that God would, through the Holy Spirit, would give these people wisdom and discernment and understanding, knowing that just how, how, what Christ did for them, for us. The older we get, the more gray hair we get, the more we realize how much we've been forgiven for. And the thing is, there's people listening now that I, I, I talk to from time to time that think that they've done too much, that they've sinned too much, that there's no way that God's going to forgive them for what they've done. Christ said on the cross, he said to the guy who's got the death penalty, he said, your sins are forgiven. He said, you will be with me day, this day in paradise. You're saved. Hmm. Paul, who murdered many, many families, was saved. So he's saying, dig in. Ask God for the wisdom. Ask God to give you comprehension on just how big a God we serve. I hear from people saying, the reason I don't believe in God is because of that he, he's the creator of all things is because the universe is just too big. There's just trillions of planets. There's no way some, somebody could do that. Well, your God's too small. Okay, and then, that's also another God. That's idolatry. <laughs> the God of the universe who created everything is, is unlimited. Okay, that's who we worship. That's who he's talking about. Verse 20. Now to him, to God, who is able and exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church, or glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. Okay, that's the end of the chapter. I told you it was short. Uh, when he says the church, please don't misunderstand it and misconstrue that as saying that the church is a building or a denomination. No, the church, when it refers to the church, is referring to a body of believers. Not a church, not a denomination. So someone says, oh, the church. No. And it's not just uh, Catholicism. It's not just Church of Christ. It's, it's, there's other ones that are doing this as well. It's thinking that they're, they're the church and that they can trace themselves back to Peter. And that's, can be just, that can be disproved pretty, pretty easily. There's, there's studies on that that show archaeology and show the proof that that's not true. Um, but here's what, you, here's what I'm asking. Paul, who is in prison, is writing this letter, and he gets more poignant and gets more personal in verse five, but then in verse or in chapter chapter five, but then in chapter six, he goes into saying, "Here's what you got to do to be protected." Um, and he said, "The protection is what you need." If you're a reader, it just not came to my mind. Um, I have a book. I don't. Let me just. Yeah, here it is. Sorry about that. I wasn't on showing this. Now I don't always agree with this writer, but on this book, as far as uh, an allegory, it's called "The Final Quest" by Melvin Joyner. Rick Joyner, not Melvin. Rick Joyner, called The Final Quest. Now this is referring to, when it goes through, it talks about the spiritual war. He makes up a, a, a battle in here, and you can see it in your head, about the battle scenes. And you can actually see a battle in your head as far as spiritual battle with real demons and real and people and angels and how it kind of works as far as you can apply this to what we're just talking about. Again, I don't agree with, uh, don't I, I don't, and, endorse everything. I haven't read all his books, but the ones I have read, this one actually caught my eye. A friend of mine gave it to me, and I've read it. So anyway, it's called The Final Quest. It's pretty interesting. If you enjoy reading, it's not that much. It's just, you know, it's, it's a fairly easy read. But anyway, we're in a battle. We're 
it's, it's not a choice between right or left, it's a choice between good and evil. We have people that tell us that, oh, it's okay to go out and murder your children. It's okay to do whatever perversion. It's okay to whatever. If you're a Christian and you're wanting to be to love people and not be arrogant, not be a pain, but you're just trying to you're just trying to be a good person and trying to serve Christ, then you're a bigot. And that's what we're you, you can be any other religion in the world or nothing and do the exact same thing and people would applaud it. But if you're a Christian, they hate your guts. Christ says, they will hate you because they hated me first. If you're going to either get a backbone or step out of the way, okay, and don't, uh, what I mean by that is, doesn't mean you have to go down and start pounding on the doors of the courthouse saying, demanding justice, okay? That's not what we're saying. God is saying to get strong in his word on the gospel first, because if you don't know who Jesus is, knowing that he's God Almighty, he's the creator, he's, the, he's our savior, he's the son of God, God the son, he's, he is the second part of the Trinity, the triune God, there's one God, three parts, he is the middle one, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, then you're wasting your time because nothing else matters. If nothing else, if you say, well, I can't go talk to people, I, I, it just it frightens me. I have family members who will can't talk to other people. It, it scares them. Okay, that's fine. That's not your gift. But you can cook or you can uh, send out, you can give tithe, you can send stuff overseas, you can you know, give Bibles. Ask God to show you what exactly he wants you to do. And he does tell you though, no matter what, whether you feel comfortable or not, is to be prepared to give an answer. That is the gospel who Jesus is and what he did for you to be saved in it. No, you may be, you're not a good person and you will die and go to hell if you don't have forgiveness from God and God, and God alone. So anyway, Christmas is almost here. Can you believe that? And it's not about Santa Claus. It's not about the, the gifts. It's, it's secularized and has been for a while. I can go into school and if I want to talk about Jesus Christ because of Christmas, they would they would say, oh, you're violating separation of church and state, which there's actually no such thing in our constitution. Um, the But if you talk about Santa Claus and, you know, Elf on a Shelf and everything else, then that boy, they're right there with you. Or, want, you know, or anything else. But know that real quickly, you can look this up under, under laws. I don't, know why who I'm talking to on this one so I kind of went off trail on this and some of you're rolling your eyes going yeah if you're speaking to somebody at, for instance I'll just pick your at your place of employment if you are alone with another employee and you're just choosing to talk about football or you know golf or last week's series on you know whatever and it's okay then it's okay to talk about Christ if you're not forcing, if there's no one else around, or if you're not forcing someone else to have to listen to it, then that, then what's happening is, is you're having a private conversation until one of you decides that they don't want to talk about it anymore. Once that happens, which that's just common sense, and you stop talking about it, whether it be football or God, and you back away, and or go to another subject. But if you're wanting to talk about Christ with somebody who's who's working there at your job, whatever that job is. And it's just the two of you, and you're not you're not stealing from your boss by stealing the time. Then um, that's perfectly legal. It won't be for long. So start being more bold. Start talking to people about Christ. Our time is short, whether it's weeks, months, or years. Because when you're standing in front of Christ, which 100% of the population of the earth will stand in front of Christ, no matter whether you believe or not, whether you say, oh, I can't wait to tell him what I think, well, you'll be on your face just like Satan will. Um, the thing is, as a Christian, as a born-again believer, you want to be guilty of saying, well, you know, I, I know you told me to go out and tell people about you, but I just, I got up here on my own, you know, I just got saved by the skin of my teeth. I'm just happy to be here, but I didn't help anybody else. Oh, I hope you're not on a boat that's sinking and I need your help. You know, 
do whatever you can. Ask God to give you the words to say before you're walking up to somebody. If you're getting ready to have a conversation with somebody, just ask God, do an SOS prayer. Father, please give me the words to say. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And then just talk to them. Just don't, don't make up stuff. Just talk to them. Be honest with them. Love them enough to tell them the truth. Love them enough to tell them about that cancerous the cancer in their soul, which is sin, that's going to kill them if they don't get it fixed. Okay? Go and, and you can go to the Pray 5. That's Pray, P-R-A-Y, the number 5.org site. It's like, how do you get saved? It's basic. And I do suggest go like to places that practice this online, like uh, Way of the Master with Kirk Cameron. And... Uh, uh, Watch those because they talk to many, many people that are really, really don't like them. It's called Way of the Master with Kirk Cameron. Um, and they do a really good job. Um, you can look on the list of pastors that I listen to on the pray5.org website. Just go to hit, when you open up the site, go up to the top uh, toolbar where it says resources. Click on it. And it says pastors I listen to. Click on that and it'll, it'll open up and start listening to them. If you want current news that you can trust, not with this garbage we have coming out, is uh, one of the places I listen to is like uh, is the Israel Israel One uh, Christian website or Messianic Christian website. I go to Amir. It's A M I R Surfati. That's T S A R I F A T I Surfati. Amir Surfati on uh, like Telegram or Behold Israel. Uh, you can go to Jack Hibbs. It's uh, H-I-B-B-S, Jack Hibbs, at Real Life Ministries. And they're going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you what's going on right there. But uh, if you have any questions, contact me on, uh, you can send your email to pray, P-R-A-Y, the number five, pray5org at gmail.com. It's pray5org at gmail.com. No spaces, no dots. You can go to my YouTube site, which is Pray5, P-R-A-Y, 5, or also Cop for Christ, C-O-P, F-O-R, capital C, H-R-I-S-T, and the number seven. They're both the same site. Both of those names will get you to the same site. And you can look at the almost 100 videos. Not very big, but it'll, it'll, it'll get you started, okay? Again, questions with Scott, shorts with Scott, will be on Friday, not tomorrow on Thursday because I'll be at a Christmas party. Uh, so if you have any questions, send them in. Uh, if not, then I'll read the ones that are here, okay? Let's go ahead and pray out. Father, thank you for this time together. Your blessings, your mercy, and your grace. Please give us your truth. We ask that you would open our eyes and give us wisdom and discernment as far as in your word. It's in the name of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Till next week, keep giving the gospel, and I'll see you then.